If you've ever happened to get a look at the top selling and most popular books on Amazon, you would have no doubt noticed that the list is largely comprised of books falling into the self-help genre. A genre that everybody is probably familiar with by now, as it is quickly becoming one of the most lucrative and successful subsections of reading. Even those who don't read have likely stumbled upon one of these books at some point. But why is it that these authors have been propelled to world world recognition? There surely must be a great deal of applicable knowledge and information stored in this non-fiction for the sector to have exploded so fast, and there likely is. The focus of these books is, aptly named, self-help, to better oneself through one's own devices. You're giving the knowledge necessary, you need but put it into practice. However, it can't be that all these crucial teachings about how one should live his own life have been unbeknownst to us until Mark Manson put them to paper in Southern Art, or when James Clear wrote Atomic Habits. And that would be correct to say, as a good deal of what makes these books so engaging to the modern man, and beliefs and practices dating back centuries, even millennia, first told up by great men who laid the groundwork for these new age self-help authors. In 65 AD, and Lucius Aeneas Seneca, commonly referred to as Seneca the Younger, has sent a message to Emperor Nero, and after a lifetime of dedicated and diligent service to the state, he is now awaiting retirement from public life. Born in 5 BC, a renowned statesman, politician, and philosopher, Seneca was a respected member of the Roman Senate. As a matter of fact, Seneca's success in rhetoric was so profound that Caligula, the emperor often cited as insane by historians, envied his talent to such a degree that he ordered him commit suicide. Seneca narrowly escaped the sentence as he was seriously ill at the time, and so Caligula assumed he would die soon anyhow. After the ascension of Caligula's uncle, Claudius, in 41 AD, Seneca would again be faced with dire circumstances, as he would be accused by the new empress of having an affair with Julia Livia, sister to Caligula. Before this act, the Senate decreed that Seneca be sentenced to death, although Claudius reduced his sentence to exile. When in 49 AD, Caligula's other sister, Agrippina, marries her uncle, Claudius, she manages to persuade her husband to annul Seneca's exile and grant him a high-ranking position in the Senate, as well as appointing him tutor to her son Nero, who would soon become emperor himself. In 54 AD, Claudius falls ill and dies. It is commonly thought that Agrippina poisoned him to ensure the ascension of her son. And sure enough, upon Claudius' death, Nero would be proclaimed emperor at the age of 16, soon after killing Claudius' true-born heir, Britannicus, to ensure his claim as emperor. Seneca, being tutor and later advisor to Nero, had a strong amount of influence over him, especially in the early parts of his reign. However, any semblance of guidance Seneca may have had over Nero quickly disappeared as the emperor became more and more depraved. Nero's mother was another one of the people who had the most hold over the young emperor, and it was likely they had some sort of sexual relationship. And so Nero, becoming exasperated with the overbearing nature of his mother, had multiple attempts made on her life, eventually succeeding in having her assassinated by one of his freedmen. After she had survived a shipwreck Nero had orchestrated, he would later claim her death as suicide. This was a major turning point in Nero's reign, which up until now had been going relatively well. He has been cited as saying that the guilt behind killing his mother never left him and tormented him until his death. Any trace of conscience or voice of reason previously present died with his mother, and with Nero throwing caution to the wind, the subsequent period of his reign would be disastrous. Upon his request of retirement, the wizened Seneca, at this point in his late 60s, was swept up in accusations of treason involved in a plot against Nero. And, although he denied them vehemently, Seneca would be sentenced to forced suicide by Nero, and, although not the first time, it would be his last. With the image of Seneca bleeding out while being lamented by all those around him, being subject to countless paintings centuries later. With such a tumultuous life, Seneca being one of the most important figures in the Julio-Claudian era, caught up in numerous scandals, and surviving all but one, you begin to wonder how it was that Seneca not only attained such a high position in Roman society, but maintained it for nearly 70 years. To this point, we don't have to speculate, as during the tail end of Nero's reign, Seneca wrote numerous letters to his friend Lucius, discussing life, philosophy, and how the Stoic ought to live a virtuous life. A hundred years later, Emperor Marcus Aurelius returns to his tent late at night. Wary from his campaign against the Quadi, he resigns himself to his study, and begins writing in his personal note, a note that will, centuries later, be considered one of the greatest works of philosophy ever put to paper. Upon the realization that his wife was barren and could bear no children, Emperor Hadrian had to resort to adopting an heir to succeed him. After much difficulty in finding a capable and young successor, he named Lucius Aelius as heir, against the wishes of everyone, as it was long thought that Hadrian would adopt his brother-in-law, Servianus. Aelius would soon succumb to his poor health, leading Hadrian to subsequently adopt his trusted general, Antoninus, as his heir, on the condition that he in turn adopt Aelius' son, Lucius Verus, as well as the adolescent Marcus Aurelius, whom Hadrian saw great promise in, although he was still too young to rule. After his grueling death, Hadrian was succeeded by Antoninus, granted the name Pius for his virtue, 
who ruled up to 161 AD, and was succeeded by his adoptive sons, Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius himself. After the fruitful reign of Hadrian, Antoninus had but little hardship in his. However, into the first year of Marcus and Verus' reign, began a conflict with Parthia which would last five years. Verus would eventually die from an illness in 169 AD. Marcus greatly mourned the loss of his brother and would rule as sole emperor until his son Commodus came of age and would rule as co-emperor alongside his father. After the war with Parthia ended in 166 AD, Marcus would wage war against a number of Germanic tribes, a war that would continue up to his death. After the much hardship and toil endured during his long years as emperor, Marcus Aurelius would die in 180 AD, presumably of natural causes, and was succeeded by his natural-born son, Commodus. Hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. When you look back at the lives of these great men who propelled Rome to its highest glory, the Pax Romana, 200 years of peace within the Roman nation, you can see a certain cycle in the state of the empire. Gaius Julius Caesar lived during a time when the Roman Republic was under constant threat. There were countless civil wars raging, with many generals attempting to seize power for themselves. Eventually, Caesar came out on top and became the ruler of Rome. Upon his death, Caesar's adopted son, Augustus, would fight countless battles against Sextus, son of Caesar's longtime rival Pompey, and later Mark Antony, triumphing in all of them. He eventually would go on to establish the Roman Empire, becoming the first Roman Emperor. Augustus ruled justly and mercifully, and is often called the most competent Roman Emperor. Those who lived under the reign of such an adept ruler would have lived well. This equilibrium he managed to establish would soon be disrupted by Caligula and soon after Nero, whom were both poor rulers and almost drove the empire into collapse. And, after the disastrous year of the four emperors in 69 AD, which saw a civil war that led to Rome having four different rulers in the span of 12 months, ending with Vespasian becoming emperor, establishing the Flavian dynasty, which would last 27 years. It would be succeeded by the Nerva Antonine dynasty, which would rule over Rome for over 80 years. It was during this time that the empire was at its largest. The five good emperors, as coined by Niccolo Machiavelli, caused expansion and maintained peace and prosperity that the Roman Empire would never again see. Nothing happens to any man which he is not formed by nature to bear. Marcus Aurelius said this in his work, Meditations. He was a stern and serious man, and this is likely what made him such a good emperor. He didn't falter in the face of hardship, for he knew it an essential component of life. Why should we curse the gods for our suffering, he would say, rather than amending our own opinion and accepting what comes by nature. The essence of Stoicism, that which allowed Seneca to accept his death sentence so calmly, when all hope was lost, which pushed Marcus Aurelius through the wars against the Germanic tribes. The Stoics knew that if they were suffering for some reason or another, they must learn to recognize whether it is in their power to change a situation or not. They face it stoically and with indifference, for it is according to nature, and nothing according to nature is evil. As Marcus Aurelius concludes in Meditations, Life is like a play. It may have five acts, but if the playwright ends the play in the third act, he has done so with a purpose. Depart then satisfied, for he also who releases thee is satisfied. <laughs>